Praise the Lord. Amen and amen. I tell you, I'm not used to the early morning service. I don't get up too good. I'm kind of a late person, you know, in the wee hours of the morning. So uh, pray with me. I'm all right, though. I'm all right because where the Spirit of the Lord is. Amen, amen, and amen. The, the Lord sent me here and gave me this message this morning that he wants you to know, each one of you to know, that there's going to be some ups and downs that you got to go through, but he wants to know that he's got your back. He wants you to know that he's in total control. He wants you to know that he knows every step that you take and whether you well or whatever the situation may be, how many mountains you got to climb or valleys you got to tread. And he says, I'm there for you. I got grace. I got grace that more than you can handle. Amen. Praise God. So I'm going to be preaching on outrageous grace. Can you put that up there? That's what it is. Grace is outrageous. Amen, amen. Praise God. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time that we have together. Lord, let your word come forth. Let it be rested in the hearts and minds of your people. Bring your anointing. Anoint your servant, Lord. Let this be a special day for each one of us, Lord. We bind every hindering force of hell that will come against us. The devil can't touch it. He's gagged, he's bound, he's changed, and you cannot interfere. We're going to uplift the Lord this day, and we're going to leave here strengthened, Lord, into whatever situation we have. Amen. 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 Well, would you take your seat? Okay. All right. Because we're going to get into the scripture. The text is taken from 2 Corinthians. But prior to that, I'm going to read uh, Ephesians. That's one of the scriptures we're going to read in your Bible. Turn to Ephesians 2. And we're going to read uh, verses 8 and 9. And then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 12 and read from 7 to 10. So I want you to keep your Bibles open. Hey, Hope. Hey, Popo. She was nothing but a baby when, when she first came in. Look, and she's, she's a mama and all of that. <clears throat> Now, Minister Nisi was talking about she's a grandmother. Praise God. She said, oh, God, like that's something. I'm a great grandmama. I'm proud of it. Amen, amen, amen. I hope they don't be too plentiful because, uh, you know, you can have them children that keep running over. Every time I have uh, something at home, the table gets smaller and smaller. Say, so, amen, can't you kind of cut it down a little bit? Amen. Praise God. But anyway, let's read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says, for by grace are ye saved. How? Through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Amen. Now, if you turn with 2 Corinthians 12. Starting with verse 7. And this is a familiar portion of scripture. But I think the Lord wants to bring it back to your attention. Because he loves his people. And there are a lot of things that, a lot of places we got to try. A lot of things we got to go through. But it says, Paul is, is saying this. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation that was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart, and he said um, that it might depart from me, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength and my power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, 
I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecution and distress for Christ's sakes for when I am weak then I am strong somebody say when I am weak then I'm strong outrageous outrageous grace that God has done for us I'm talking about the God kind of grace the grace that's outrageous that exceeds the limits the kind of grace that's unconscionable the kind of grace that's shocking them the kind of grace that's extreme it's excessive it's totally outrageous now this is a text that every Christian every born-again child of God should bury in your heart so that when sickness come which is gonna come when there's sorrow when there's trouble when death comes knocking the Lord wants you to hear the words of this text precious consoling words that says my grace is sufficient for thee we may not have the answer we may not know the answer but God says my grace my grace is sufficient for you now what do we mean by grace now most of us have been around a while we have the pat answer um, you know we we talk about grace or we can sing about it and shout about it and testify about it but what does it really mean now the theological terms those have been Antioch or whatever we learn that grace is God's grace is unmerited favor grace is a free gift now grace is not law grace is not of the law you see because of sin we were bound by the law the law that was given to Moses made nothing perfect so we because of sin we were bound by the law and because of sin we were condemned by the law because the law couldn't save us now because of grace though through the shed blood of Jesus Christ we have been set free how many are free in the place today okay it was grace it was God's grace now grace has nothing whatsoever to do with human merit you can't earn it you can't work for it it has nothing to do with you grace is something that's undeserved it is unmerited favor of God not only of God but in in the almighty force of God it is God's matchless overpowering love it is his favor the scripture lets us know that this grace is for all men for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God now as we read that part of the scripture about salvation in Ephesians 2 it says for by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves it is a gift of God it is the outrageous gift of grace now many of you have heard of you've been students or scholars in some uh, seminary or the cemetery or what you know one of those Christian schools come on somebody you heard about A.W. Tozer well he's a noted theologian and this is what he said about salvation and talking about grace he says that from our side it's a choice when you walk down the aisle or wherever you receive the Lord say yes Lord I receive that's your choice that's your will that's what you want but from God's side it's different you say yes to Jesus but from God's side it becomes a seizing upon it becomes an apprehension an arrest a grasp it is laying hold upon it is a conquest by God it's an overthrow it's a subdual it's a defecting 
It's a triumph by almighty God. It is a warfare between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. So what happens? What happens? Talking about grace. God literally snatches us up out of the kingdom of darkness and he translates us into the kingdom of light. Somebody ought to say hallelujah or something. I know I ain't here by my sight except the lights are on, but is anybody here? So what happens here? God lifts us up out of the miry clay into all the mess that we were in. And he plants our feet on a rock. And that rock is Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, salvation brings us from the guttermost to the uttermost no matter what you was doing down in the gutter hallelujah but 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 God snatches you out of the gutter and brings you up to the uttermost by his grace somebody say grace hallelujah you see because salvation belongs to our God he is the initiator I know how we talk about you know um I went to church and I found God and all of this kind of stuff. But God's the initiator. We're going to talk about it a little bit later because he's standing there for those who are not saved. Just waiting. Waiting in line for you. We don't choose him. He chooses us. How about that? We don't find God. God finds us. He finds us. He rescues us. Oh my God from the perils of sin. Why does he do it? Because his love, because his grace demands it. Amen. Now, God finds us. He delivers us. He rescues us and he transforms us. You know, there's a whole lot of talk on television about the makeover. They give you a makeover. That's on the outside. But I'm going to tell you, in things of God, nobody but nobody can make you again. Nobody but nobody can make you over but he who made you the first time. Hallelujah. He created you. That's the big makeover. He translated you and gave you beauty for ashes. Now, if you turn to Ephesians uh, 1, I just want you to see it um, so that you can't say that I wrote it. Okay. You know, Pastor Doctor said that. No, the word of God says it. Now, Ephesians 1, 4 says, according as he has chosen us, that word chosen, you see that? You got it? I know I'm going a little too fast because I'm used to being a teacher and you got everything right there. But according to as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him. Hallelujah. Now, here we have the, the, the usual things that you ask. We got the who, the what, the how, the when. Now he said, he has chosen us. Who is the he? God has chosen us. What has he done? He has chosen us, okay? How did he choose us? He chose us in him in him is who Christ Jesus and when did he do it he did it before the foundation of the world what for did he do it that we should be holy and without blame before him in love I'm enjoying this I really amen okay in first Peter I want you to see that first Peter so you know what I'm talking about the grace of God First Peter 2 9 you got that okay turn it real quick all right first Peter 2 9 is anybody helping me out up here oh they, they're helping me out oh, I put ain't nobody helping me out up there I pass that in which I don't usually do on Friday night I ain't got a thing up there Hallelujah. but anyway let's read it <clears throat> But ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, <clears throat> a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
We are chosen. Turn to somebody and say, I'm chosen. Turn to somebody else and tell them, I'm chosen. I'm a chosen vessel. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, in the study of the word grace in the New Testament Greek, okay, just we're not going to get too deep, but I just want to, this is one that I like. It says of grace as an action which is beyond the ordinary course of what is expected and therefore commendable. That's what grace is. It's beyond what you could expect. It is nothing that you would expect. In fact, all of heaven couldn't, couldn't, couldn't expect what God was going to do. And I'm sure the devil didn't expect what he was going to do. What a description of Calvary. Totally outrageous. God doing the unexpected. He took his only begotten son no one could imagine what he would do a thing like that now maybe we could sit back and say mm -hmm. maybe if he had three sons and he took one but he took his only son how many would give their only son for somebody else nobody nobody uh, and what he did, uh, he, he let him be put on a cross with a bunch of crazy people and, and, and that he bled and he, he died. And he's to save what? To save sinners. To save the enemy. Amen. He died, but he rose again. And he did it that we might have eternal life and to live for the rest of eternity with God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's totally outrageous, but I'm so glad he did. So glad. Outrageous, unspeakable, but that's the nature of grace. The grace of God. And now we can understand the words when it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. So what a God. Who can measure the depths of God's love and grace? Can anyone know? You know, sometimes I, I, I just love to sit and meditate on the Lord. And then I was thinking about heaven. I said, now, Lord, I hope it's not one of those things that when I get there, you got all them pushy folks. You know how pushy folks get in front of him pushing you can't get to see him and you trying to peep over there to try to see him. I said, Lord, I hope that ain't the case. He said to me, I got grace, I got love, more than you could ever handle. If God would turn the force of his love upon any one of us, it would kill us. That's how deep his love is, amen? And so also I think about, I don't know about how many of you, but I think about how blessed those women were who sat with Jesus. Well, you know, that's, that, that's my husband. And they, they could see him, they could touch him, they could hold him, they could listen to him, they could worship him, they could wash his feet and pull down the hair and dry them. Oh, come on somebody. I'm talking about Jesus. I said, Lord, how blessed they are. You know what he said to me? You are more blessed because you don't see him, but you love him. You don't see him, but you believe him. You don't see him, oh, somebody, but you worship him. Oh, yes, his grace, his grace. So the measure of grace, it says, is sufficient. Now, what do we mean by sufficient? It's beyond all that's needed. It means that it's adequate. It means that it's enough. It's satisfactory, it's plenty, it's ample. Okay, so the measure of God's love and grace is sufficient to the source. The source is God. It's all sufficient as to the outflow. It's like a river from the deepest valley to the highest mountain. And it's never going to lose its power to forgive. It's not going to lose its power to restore. It's not going to lose its power to transform. Hallelujah. I just want to tell you a little story. Now, I'm going to take my time now. I know a lot of you say you go over time on Sunday, but I'm going to take my time. Because I got something to tell you. A friend of mine said the Lord told her, 
I want you to go to the inner city which she didn't live too far and I want you to walk the streets and I want you to do it at night you know late at night so she being obedient she says well the Lord will protect me because I'll be out here of course there was the street folks the pimps and the pushers and all them other folks out there so he told her listen I want you to go to ATM machine and I want you to take out $20. So being obedient, she went, took out $20, walked down the street, and then she said, well, Lord, what do you want me to do with this $20? He said, I want you to give it to a friend. So she said, okay. So she comes upon a woman, shaking, needing a fix, waiting for the John to come by, all messed up as she could be. So she walks up to the woman because she had a discernment that this is one that God wanted her to speak to. So she said to the woman, here's $20. So she said, lady, do you know who I am? She said, yes. I'm a prostitute. She says, all right, all right. The Lord wants you to have this. So she said, I'm waiting for a John to come by. Do you know what I'm going to spend the $20 on? She said, yes, I do. She said, wait a minute. You one of those born again? She said, yes, I am, and God loves you. You know, when a, people, a person is in a fix like that, you don't come down talking about a whole lot of theology and stuff like that. Amen? All you need to do is meet the need. So, see, so you one of them born again? So she said, yes. She said, you know, I got a brother. He's one of them born again. And, you know, as soon as I get myself together and I get myself fixed up and, you know, not be out here and everything, I think I'm going to try to be a born again. So she went away. That was the end of that. About a year or so later, my friend is at a meeting. And this woman runs up to her and says, hi, hi. She didn't recognize who she was. It was totally fixed up and everything. She says, my name is, she says, well, she didn't remember the name. She said, I'm the one you gave the $20 to, and now I'm a born again. I'm a born again. Oh, God's grace, outrageous grace. He even called her a friend, even before she was saved. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Maybe we close up now, man. Let me shout a while. God's grace is sufficient in every time in need. It's all sufficient in every stage of life and every hour of the day, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a young adult, whether you're a middle age or old age. David said, once I was young, but now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken out of his seed out begging for bread. All sufficient grace of God. God's grace. Now there are some six billion people in the world and it's still growing. God's got sufficient grace to supply every need if we only trust him. Amen. Now let's look at our text. Hallelujah. Go back to 2 Corinthians 12. We're going to deal with that for a little while. You got it? Okay, now here we have Paul who has a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what that thorn was. There's a whole lot of speculation as to what this thorn was. However, we know that it was something that vexed him and it hurted him very much. Now, some people, you know, they, um, uh, a, a lot of uh, books that you use, what do you call them? Commentaries. They have all kinds of speculation in there. Some said he had a bad temper that hindered his work. I didn't read nothing like that, but maybe they saw it. Others say that it was a condition of the nervous system. I didn't see that. Maybe you did. Some said he had a stammering tongue that he couldn't hardly get out the gospel. I didn't see nothing like that. Some said he had the distortion of the face. He had headaches. He had gout. He had eye trouble. But others insisted that the thorn consisted of people who fought his work and hindered his labor in the Lord. Now I go along with that. 
many here have tried to do something for the Lord and there's always somebody messing with you all up in your face uh, trying to hinder you uh, from doing what God has called you to do. Hallelujah. And we step aside and we said, the devil is a liar. <laughs> Amen. But there's always somebody trying to stop you. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly what Paul was going through. But this text could apply to any of us. The thorn could be any affliction that we might have. Any trouble that we're going through. Anything that tries to keep us from being what God wants us to be. And it could be a physical condition. You say, if I didn't have this, then I could do this for God. It could be a mental or emotional handicap or sometimes a lot of stress that you're going through. You know, like if I didn't have this and I, if, if it wasn't for this. But I want to tell you, you're here today and I want you to know that God has said, even though you might have a thorn in your flesh, I want you to know that God's consolation, his comfort is always available. His grace is indeed sufficient to carry you through whatever. Amen. Now let's look at Paul again. Now what did Paul do about the thorn in his flesh? We can almost visualize Paul and maybe even you that you're going through something. He was tormented and possibly it could have been a disease. I don't know what it was but he was pained. He had pain. He was uncured but most of all he was just baffled. He was baffled by his condition. So he, what did he do? He took his case to the Supreme Court. He took it to the highest court of the land. He took it to the Lord. And in verse 8 it says, Paul says, for this thing, he called it a thing. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. He sought three times. God, I'm baffled. Whatever the pain was, I don't know, the aggravation. What does this bring you to remind you of a reflection of the words of Jesus Christ? You remember that on the night before he was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus fell on his face before the Father and he cried out in agony. He prayed three times, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me nevertheless. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. So I want to tell you in troubles, in times of trouble, in times of sickness, in times of distress and upheaval, we got to go to the Lord in prayer. Lay your burdens before the Lord. And there's a song that take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Amen. A lot of times we pray, take our burdens up there before the day is over, we go and take it back. Take your burdens to the Lord and, and, and leave it, leave them there. We got to wait on the Lord and to be of good courage. So here we have the brilliant Paul. The Paul that sat at the feet of the great scholar Gamaliel. Here we have Paul, the persecutor of the Christians. Here we have Paul, the powerful Pharisee. We have Paul who was arrested by the Holy Ghost on the road to Damascus where he was going to kill and persecute some Christians. But now baffled by his situation, we now see Paul, the man of God, laying out before God in prayer. He's baffled by his condition and it has not changed. So what does he do? He cries out, Lord. Lord, you are my God. That reminds me of David's prayer in Psalm 63 when he said, Lord, oh God, thou art my God. This is showing an intimate relationship with God. This is not a casual relationship. This is a close relationship. You are my God. How many can say you are my God? Hallelujah. Paul says, Lord, I'm your servant. And Lord, you've always answered my prayers before. Have you ever been there? 
Lord has answered all kinds of prayer, but you get to one, you ain't heard nothing from him. So but Paul begins to bring to God's remembrance all the answered prayers in the past as if God had forgotten what he did. So Paul begins to pray. He says, remember when I was in the storm and shipwreck, you sent an angel to my rescue. Lord, when I was in Philippi, you rocked the jailhouse with an earthquake and brought me out to freedom. Lord, when I was trapped in Macedonia, you let me down over the wall in a basket. And Lord, do you remember when I was being stoned and left for dead out in the middle of the street? You raised me up and you saved me. Now, Lord, now, Lord, I need an answer to my prayer. Amen. In verse 8, Paul says, I sought the Lord once. No answer came. I sought the Lord twice. My weakness remained. I sought the Lord three times. It seemed for Paul that all heaven was closed up. Was closed up. No answer. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever been there? Have you ever had an experience such as that? And you say, God, where are you? What's up with this? Lord, you see my predicament. Lord, don't you care? Lord, your word said that you love us. And Lord, I've been in this so long. It looks like it's never going to uh, 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 go away. And so this reminds me, you remember when the disciples were uh, with Jesus when a mighty storm arose at sea and they were in danger of sinking and drowning. Uh, somebody shook Jesus from his sleep. Uh, and said, Lord, careth thou not that we perish? Have you ever, ever been there? There was a sister here that I'm sure Sister Nita and some of us remember. She had a daughter that was like sent from hell. Maybe you might have one of those in your house. I, 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 not this house, the house down the street, not yours. I mean, we prayed, we held hands, we prayed in fellowship, we prayed openly, we prayed in houses, we did everything we could do because this girl was driving her crazy. So it felt like God wasn't listening at all. So she went to the Lord and said, Lord, give me another problem because I'm tired of this one. Anything. <laughs> Hallelujah. You ever been there? Like, I'm tired of this problem. If I got to have a problem, give me something else to worry about because I'm sick of this. <laughs> but God does answer prayer. And her daughter is now saved and on fire for the Lord. <laughs> amen. Amen. I want you to know that God indeed hears prayers of the saints. His word declares it. He doesn't play games with human frailties. His answer is yea or nay, yes or no, or maybe it's wait. Now that's the hardest thing to do to wait. You know, how long you're going to wait. Amen. But, but, but that's not the problem so much. You know what the real problem is? God doesn't always answer prayer the way you want it or the way you expect it. Come on, you know that. In his own infinite wisdom, he answers in a way that is best for you. And sometimes it needs to be wait because he's putting things together, putting people together, putting situations together so that when it come, you say, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Hallelujah. Okay, you might expect for him to answer in a logical way. But God will come and answer you in a totally illogical way. So I could, how could that be? You may expect him to answer you, let's say, in a kind of a rational way, with your mind, the human mind, you know what God would answer. He comes in an irrational way. You may expect an answer from a natural type of thing. You're waiting for the natural, and God comes up and hops up with the supernatural. Amen, amen. He answers the way that he knows is best for you. He can even bend some of man-made rules 
to answer your prayer, but he'll answer. Now, not only that, but God can answer in some strange ways. Y'all know what I'm talking about, you think about it. Now that was strange. If we look back at Elijah, he was running from Jezebel, okay? And after he went to the widow and she fed him everything, then he went by the pool and sat down. And do you know what he did? He had a scavenger bird, a raven, to bring him meat and bread three times a day. Now, no holy prophet of God like Elijah would come anywhere near a scavenger bird. No way, no way. But this bird, a scavenger that was unclean to the Jews, had his talons and he brings him some meat. Okay. He wrapped some bread around it. You remember when Peter was on the rooftop and then he was in a dream and the Lord let down a sheet and in that sheet was uh, some beasts and wild, all kinds of creeping things. And the word of God said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, I don't eat that. I don't eat what's common and unclean. And the Lord says, what, 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 don't say what I have cleaned to be un, uh, common. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. God answers in strange ways. Moses began to ask God, how can I feed all of these people out there? They were murmur and, and, and complaining worse than love gospel. Not love gospel, but the church down the street. Y'all know what I am. Anybody got any eggs, please don't throw them up here. Hallelujah. Moses was trying to feed the people. And God sent a supernatural manna from on high. When I was in college, at least once a week, we would go in there to the dining hall to eat. And when they would come out, I said, what did you have? We had wonder meat. So what was wonder meat? We wonder what it was. What it, amen. 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 So God sent a supernatural manner from on high. He answered Joshua at Jericho with a tumbling wall that fell down. There he had people marching all around and singing and blowing trumpets and the, the wall fell down. Weird and strange. But Joshua conquered Jericho. God answered his prayer. He answered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a hot oven. Because they told him, like, King, we're not going to worship the, uh, the golden idol. We ain't going to do that. Our God will deliver us. And even if he don't do it, we ain't going to worship because he's going to deliver us. Threw him in the oven. And there they met the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, the fourth man. And Nebuchadnezzar, when he saw that, he said, everybody in this kingdom going to serve the God of, oh, hallelujah, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. God answered the prayer. God will deliver. God does not always answer the way you want or expect. And if you would look back, you see how God has answered your prayer in ways you didn't expect. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But prayer was answered in a more powerful way than you could imagine. In fact, it was a jaw-dropping type of answer. Oh my God, I didn't realize it was coming that way. He can take somebody that you couldn't stand and come and bring you some money to pay your rent. Or he could be that one to stand beside you when you're in the hospital. God works in mysterious ways. For who knows the mind of God and who can be his counselor? My God, hallelujah. God answers to Paul was greater than the prayer. The Lord spoke to Paul and he said, Paul, Paul, my grace, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul got it. Now he understood. When Paul heard this, he replied and in verse 9, you'll find it. He said, I glory in my infirmities. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul said this, and I know I have felt this way. I'd rather have the thorn and thou added grace 
than to be rid of the thorn and have not your grace. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. As Christians, we need to understand the sufficiency of the grace of God in our lives. What we do, we proudly boast that God's grace is sufficient. We sing it, we, we do all kinds of things. But yet, when we get on our knees to pray to God, that we may have no problems. But the word of God lets us know that our walk is not a bed of roses. For many are the affliction of the righteous. This is what our prayer may sound like. Lord, get the devil off my back. Kill the devil for me. Take away all temptations that might confront me. Let me have no problems to plague my life. Lord, give me perfect immunity from all disasters, from all assaults and danger that have attacked my struggle. And oh, Lord, do this for me. Do it. Do it. I don't want no problems. I want excellent health. And I want to have much prosperity. But the Apostle Paul passes out of the negative condition altogether. And he says in verse 10, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, when I'm weak, then I'm stronger because the power of God will be working in me. I want to let you know that you'll never be able to say that God's grace is sufficient until you've tested him. You got to test him. Okay, we test a whole lot of stuff. You can name a whole lot of stuff we test. Uh, you know, you, you test that person before you get married to him. I don't mean, you know, the, you know, the, the night, you know, like, what's you, what's up with you? Now, I ain't talking about, uh-huh, I see where your mind is. But we, we, we test the attitudes and the personalities. Now, don't go and say, Pastor Darden, say, we're together now, I got to test you. Uh-uh. We test a lot of things. Man takes a plane, tests the plane to see if it's going to fly under certain conditions. There's rope that he tests to see uh, how much weight it can, it can handle. Man can test a piece of steel to see, you know, just how strong. There's a whole a lot of things. You know a lot of things that are, are tested. But God almost begs us, test me. Test me. Prove me. Since it's not up there, it doesn't matter. But one of the things that we should glory in and we should read very often, because this is true, Malachi 3.10 now, you can write it down if you don't turn to it. Because it says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Test me. Prove me. And see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. Come on, test me. I want you to test him. Prove him. He's begging you to do it. Let him show himself strong for you. And even in Psalms, it said, test and see that the Lord is good taste him prove him oh yes he's good I've said this many times but the, the Jews when they have a newborn baby and it's old enough even to sit up they would take the Torah and put some honey on it and let the baby lick the Torah so the baby would grow up and say that taste and see the word of God is good taste it so in the crucible of experience we test God we lean upon his everlasting arm. We try him out. We stand on his word. We stand on his promises. We stand on his love. And the word of God said, when you've done it all to stand, just stand. So I ain't moving from here, devil. I'm standing on the word of God. And the devil can't touch you. If he touch you and you're on in the anointing, he just might get saved. Or we'll kill him. Hallelujah. Everyone who have tested the Lord, have done this to test him, they can say that God's grace is sufficient in every need. How many can say that? 
Amen. Hallelujah. God is so good. Oh, yes, he is. I'm not going to keep you much longer, but I got to do this. I told you I'm going to take my time. Praise God. The Lord is faithful and true. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. He provides even before we need them. He is the God of and the giver of grace and glory. He is the one who cannot lie. He is a God man, Jesus Christ. He's a mediator. He's the atoner for our sin. He is a complete redeemer. He's the advocate. He's our sorrow, sharer, and our burden bearer. Somebody put your hands together and give him glory. Man can boast about many things. He's capable of doing enormous amount of things. He was created by God with a mental capacity that far outseeds any other creature on the face of the earth. Oh, he can build skyscrapers, tall ones. He can build bridges that go over rivers and lakes and streams. He can build automobiles, although Toyota's having a little problem. He can build airplanes. He can build telecommunication systems that computed. But there's one thing that man can't do. What do you think that is? One thing that he cannot do. He cannot save himself from a burning hell. He can't do that. It takes the grace. The grace and power of almighty God. And no matter how great the sin. God's grace is sufficient. To cleanse from all unrighteousness. His grace is greater than all of our sins. The word of God said, where sin abound, grace does much more abound. In fact, this is one thing I like. His grace is so outrageous and so sufficient that he has that grace even before you got saved. It's called prevenial grace. He was waiting there for you. Oh, yeah, waiting. Prevenial grace. There was a, a man who was in this church. He's no longer here. He moved to another state. But he was telling his testimony how he was a, a drug addict. Not only a drug addict, but he was also a pusher. And so he ended up snorting or whatever they do. See, I'm, you know, I, I was a Johnny Walker person. I wasn't, a, I wasn't the coke. That was before my time. But anyway, he... he snorted up all of the drugs or whatever they did and they were looking for him for the money honey where is the money he had spent all the money they was coming for him they was going to kill him he knew that so he went to one of them sleazy hotels and went up to the top um, floor got him a room and he thought about his family and everything he said but I got to do this because they're going to kill me he opened up the window put his leg outside the window to commit suicide and he heard a voice say isn't there a better way he had never heard the voice of God but he knew in his heart that God was speaking to him he came back out of that window fell on his face uh, repented and, and received God right there in that room outrageous grace God waiting for him to come to him but isn't it amazing, a few weeks later, he, he said, I go a different way, I hide from them. But he was walking down the street, nowhere to duck in. And here these guys was coming, facing him, coming up the street. He said, oh God, oh God, I know they're going to kill me. So he couldn't duck anywhere. So the guys walked up to him and they passed him right on by. They didn't even recognize him. Outrageous grace. The grace of God, prevenial grace, grace that protects you, amen, and put a shield and a covering all around you, hallelujah, because God was there all the time. God was there standing in line, waiting for you to turn around and say, God, here I am. He's been there all the time. For you who are not saved, God is there, prevenial grace. Hallelujah. Somebody say grace. grace. Outrageous grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
It is the nature of grace to fill a void of vacancy. Grace turns weakness into strength. Grace turns deformity into beauty. The Bible says God gives us beauty for ashes. He takes away the ugly, filthy, stinking garment of sin. And he clothes us with his beauty, with his righteousness, with the raiment of glory. God changes uncleanness into purity. And he changes hatred into love. As we look at the Apostle Paul, we see that God had built a fence around him. He had placed handicaps on him. But Paul now begins to say he gloried in his handicap, in his thorn in the flesh. Because it was God's way of making a road for the advancement of the gospel to be preached. So it is with every Christian's life. The very things that seem to hedge you in your handicaps, your limitation, that thorn in your flesh. The tests that you go through, the temptations that confront you are all used by God to make a path for your preaching of the gospel. Whether it's in the pulpit, whether it's in your home, whether it's on the job, wherever the spirit of God will lead you. Oh, yes, you got all kinds of limitation. That's why I came today. You know the limitation, but God said, that's all right. I got your back. I got everything under control. Hallelujah. And my grace is sufficient. I'm going to keep you no matter what. You walk around and dragging a leg, go on and do what God told you to do. Get off the pot. Get off the pity. Get off the murmuring and get up and say, I don't care what's wrong with me. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to preach the gospel because God's grace is sufficient to carry me through. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of the greatest accomplishment in life has been by people who were handicapped in some way. Handicap draws us closer to the Lord so that the testimony that we have can count for God. If you've never been through anything, you can't stand up and tell people something. But if you've been through something, you can tell them about what God has done. We got so many people, that they, they knew Christians. They ain't never been through something, but they're going to go through something because that's the nature of what God. He's got to test you. You got to understand that you got to be tested. But God love surrounds you. Amen. There are obstacles and difficulties in, in your way. Maybe there's a serious illness and God will heal you, but whatever it is, keep doing what God told you to do until he heals you. There may be some mental frustrations. Keep on keeping on. God's grace is there. Maybe some spiritual inequities. Keep on preaching the gospel. Maybe it's a marriage problem. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a family problem, a problem in the home. Don't let that deter you. Deter you. Keep on speaking the name of Jesus. Maybe there's a financial situation, a health issue. It may be even a wounded spirit, but let me tell you about the wounded spirit. It is more dangerous than those of the body. God cannot use a wounded spirit. The only thing he can do with a wounded spirit is heal it. So run to God. He's ready to heal you so he can use you. Now, maybe it's an unbalanced complex. We got people in the church with inferior complex. They are shy. They said, Lord, I can't do this. I don't know how to do that. Get up and do it anyway. Get up. The first time years ago, a Bishop Kaufman told me to preach, I was so nervous, I told a friend of mine, if I pass out up there, come and get me. Come and get me. Maybe it is because God's power can make you strong in weakness. And we got not only the inferior people that shine can't do, we got the superior people that think that I can do everything. <laughs> Hallelujah. But God can handle that too. Maybe it's loneliness. Wherever it is and whatever it is in prayer, face the fact. That this is my limitation. This is my handicap. And work with it in prayer with God. 1 Peter 5.10. Nothing's up there. Okay. Hallelujah. Am I here at all? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know. Oh, 
Lord that got it up there. Was that the first time? Oh, oh okay. All right, because I'm getting ready to take off my halo, jump off the cross, take my wings down and come. Come on, somebody. Come on. Amen. Amen. First Peter 5.10 says, but the God of all grace, this is after you've gone through things, who has called us into his internal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have what suffered a while. Come on. Make you perfect. He's going to make you perfect while we wait on him. His, uh, his grace is sufficient. He's going to establish you. He's going to strengthen you. And he's going to settle you. That's his word because his grace is sufficient. Amen. You can put your hands together. Yes. <laughs> Paul understood the limitation is where your strength ends and where God's power begins. Amen. Pastor Lillian often says that when she's preaching, sometimes she doesn't really, you know, know what to do. But when she starts preaching, she can feel the hand of the Spirit just pushing her. Preach. Preach. Because God's uh, grace is sufficient. Uh, just open up your mouth and I'll feel it. Amen. Some of you preachers, don't even worry about it. Get into the Word. Let the Word get in your spirit and stand up and just give the Word. Amen. Amen. In your weakness, you are made strong. The limitation called by your weakness is God's chance to prove his grace is sufficient. He'll give you power to overcome. You see, our limitations calls us to do our best for the Lord. Because we depend upon the anointing of the Holy Spirit and not ourselves. If you depend upon the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will take you through. I want you to know that God does not want you to fail. He wants you to succeed. Now, briefly, I want to remind you of someone who knew that God's grace was sufficient. This was a true story of a young man who had an accident when he was young, and it left him totally paralyzed. He had been bedridden now for 25 years. He couldn't even brush his teeth. But you talk about Jesus and his eyes would light up. He loved to talk about Jesus laying on his back. Well, his wife, through him, had improvised a kind of rack that put up in front of his chest. And books would be put on that, placed on that. And then his wife would turn the pages for him and pen each paper a page with a clothespin. He read book after book after book and although his body was dead he was paralyzed hallelujah he threw his granddaughter because his mind was not paralyzed his mouth was not paralyzed he wrote beautiful poems and poetry that came from his head through his weakness God made him strong hallelujah there are I want you to know there are those who can preach a more powerful sermon on the flat flat of their back in the hospital okay then some of us can standing in the pulpit many people go to the hospital and there's someone who's preaching the gospel laying flat on the back hallelujah there are those that are handicapped that can paint a beautiful picture with their toes then most of us can do it can with two hands and a well body. You remember Johnny Erickson Tata, that one in a wheelchair, painting pictures with her toes. God's grace is sufficient. In her weakness, God made her strong, and she has a great ministry now. I want you to know that Beethoven, the great composer, he was deaf. He couldn't hear. But he composed concertos and, and all kinds of things for the, for the ears of those that who could hear. John Milton, the English poet, blinded at an early age, he wrote his epic masterpiece on the fall of men. And he peered through blinded eyes and looked into eternity and wrote paradise lost. In his weakness, God made him strong, for God's grace is sufficient. John Bunyan, the man of God, he preached Christ boldly. They put him in jail for 12 years, but he wrote a book 
called Pilgrim's Progress uh, that has taken his place uh, next to the Bible in influence uh, in his weakness. Uh, he became strong. Uh, truly God's grace is sufficient. David, the psalmist David, his life was full of persecution. His enemies wanted to kill him. Although he was crowned king, his best, his very best was not sitting on a throne wrapped in a robe of purple and gold, but his best was rather in the 23rd Psalm when he was passing through the valley in the shadow of death. He cried, I will fear no evil for thou art with me, knowing that God's grace is sufficient and that God's strength were made perfect in weakness. Love Gospel Assembly. I want you to know that God loves to put you in a position in the areas where you are weakest so he can be strong. That's where he wants to put you. What you should do is let God be big in the areas of your fears. Let his grace make you fearless. Step out and say, when I'm weak, I am strong, for God's grace is sufficient for me. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yes, yes. Amen, amen, amen. I want you to know when there's a lot of clouds, there's going to be a lot of vision by grace. Where there's a lot of darkness, Grace sends a, a lot of light. When there's a lot of hatred, uh, grace sends a lot of love. I want you to know that God's grace is always sufficient. It is grace that's abundant, overflowing and free. It is grace and all grace, nothing but grace. It is grace abounding towards you uh, in your personal life and in your in eternal needs. It is grace that we can be assured. So what we got to do about grace? We got to believe it. We got to expect it. And we got to thank God for it because it abounds in every good work. Hallelujah. Somebody put your hands together. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians 9, 8 says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That ye always having all sufficiency in all things may, bound, uh, may abound to every good work. So I say to you, in closing, amen, amen, that there will be a lot of mountains in your way. A lot of circumstances, a lot of things that you can't understand they come and they go but what you need to do is push back the mountain push it back and begin to say grace grace God's grace is sufficient for me no matter what the situation may be and we need to stand up and say thank you Jesus for the grace it is by grace that I stand hallelujah Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Come on. Let's begin to praise him. Praise the Lord for grace. Praise him for abundant grace. Praise him that grace is abundant and free. Get it for me. Okay. Hallelujah. No matter what you're going through. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 That is the word for you today. Whatever you're going to go through. Just remember God's grace is there. Grace is there for you. It's sufficient. He knows what you're going through. And even if you have to wait, it seems a little bit longer. Just wait. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody thank him. Thank him, Lord. Thank him. Hallelujah. Nisi, come and close us out. Hallelujah. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. Praise. Thank you, thank you, thank you for staying tuned in today. 
Did you enjoy today's message? I pray that you did. And I also pray that your relationship with God is growing by leaps and bounds day by day. Now there's so much more to come, so I want you to be sure to like, follow, and share us on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Just type in Love Gospel Assembly, and I'm sure you will be blessed by what you hear and see. And in the meantime, be sure to ring that subscribe bell. You won't want to miss all that's coming up. So have a blessed day.